गुड इवनिंग फ्रेंड्स गुड इवनिंग फ्रेंड्स होप यू आर वेल एंड डूइंग फाइन एंड थैंक्स फॉर ज्वाइनिंग दिस कॉल टू डिस्कस द मार्केट आउटलुक वेन मार्केट वेन वी रिलीज दिस इन वाइट लास्ट वीक मार्केट वर ट्रेडिंग अराउंड सिक्सटी फाइव थाउजेंड एंड टूडे एज वी स्पीक मार्केट आर क्लोज टू नाउ सिक्सटी सेवन थाउजेंड सो सच एज बीन द मोमेंटम इन द मार्केट एंड दर फॉर टूडेज वेबिनार बिकम्स इवन मोर इंटरेस्टिंग uh to give you a set of background for this call around january when we came out with our annual year book which was titled around the theme india and oasis in desert actually that theme played out in last 6 months markets have moved up significantly but then markets are markets at times they move ahead of the ma macros sometimes they lag the macros or fundamentals and today's discussion when markets are trading all, uh, close to all time high we have with us Chirag Satalwar, our head of equities. Uh, speaking about Chirag, uh, Chirag has been with us for more than two decades, and today oversees equity investments of over nearly three lakh crores. And then personally, uh, he has been managing more than seventy-five thousand crores of equity assets. Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for taking the time to hear us today. I have a brief presentation on the economy and equity market outlook. So I plan to take maybe 20 to 30 minutes to run through this presentation. The presentation really covers the outlook for the overall economy and our perspective on the market today. So let me start with the economy bit. And I know most people are less interested in the economy and more interested in the market. So we'll spend a little bit less time on the economy. But I think it's important to put this in context from a long-term standpoint. because at the end of the day the economy is what drives corporate earnings and corporate earnings drive eventually stock market performance so while we get caught up very often in what is happening today tomorrow next month and next year we forget what has happened over an extended time frame and here what we've shown is gdp growth over the last 40 years and we've broken it up into 10 year buckets and what is remarkable is that india has achieved very consistent and high growth despite all the challenges which have taken place in each of these various decades and growth has been roughly between 12 to 14% with about half of it coming from real gdp growth and the balance coming from inflation and i think this is the key point to focus on when you look at long term investing because when the economy grows at 12 13% um that is when you will see over a period of time corporate earnings will also reflect that kind of growth and when corporate earnings grows at 12 13% the market will also reflect that and give similar returns so this is why this is the underpinning this is the reason why over a longer period of time all investors say that equity markets give you a 12 to 14% return and the reason for that 12 14% return it's not that we pluck the number out of the sky it's not a whim of fancy it is simply because the economy itself grows at 12 to 14% and when that takes place the underlying earnings and the underlying stock market will also give those kind of returns now of course the stock market itself will not give you predictable returns like gdp growth and there is a lot of volatility in terms of returns depending on entry point and exit point and we'll get to that later on but i think what is important to point out is this is the long term growth but i think is interesting is how short term growth also stacks up extremely well from an indian standpoint so today india is really the darling of the global economies for two or three reasons one is of course we are seeing growth in india gdp growth uh, by rbi estimates is expected to be 6.5% in uh, this year and we are one of the fastest growing large economies so that's the first point the second is we are seeing that inflation in india is manageable so unlike in the west where inflation has jumped up uh, from what used to be 2 3% to 6 7 8% in india inflation has ranged between 4 to 6% for for a long period of time and continues to be in that range so from an inflation standpoint as well india compares quite favorably so growth stands out we are head and shoulders above others inflation is also manageable and certainly looks to be more manageable than what we are seeing outside of india we don't face structural issues related to energy we don't face structural issues related to labor force participation etc and the third is from a political standpoint uh of course india goes into elections uh next year but we uh, there is an expectation that there will be political stability so when you put these three things together it creates a very strong picture there is no other economy which is large which is growing 
where inflation is under control and where politics appears to be benign. And I think that is really what makes India uh, in a unique position today. What we've highlighted on this slide is some of the long-term factors uh, which are at work. Uh, we've shown on the left-hand side how GDP growth is expected to be at about 6% over the next five, six years and considerably higher than what you see outside of India. It is partly driven by a very young working age population in India. And of course, the fact that we have low debt to GDP is certainly something which helps. Um, this is a little bit more uh, near-term perspective in terms of what are we seeing today. So if you break the economy up between uh, consumption and investments, um, we just wanted to highlight our key observations today. So let me start with the investment bit because this is uh, the part of the economy which is doing particularly well today. Uh, investments can be broken up into public capex, corporate capex, and private capex. And uh, uh, two of these se three segments are today firing extremely well. Public capex, which is government capex on infrastructure, continues to be extremely strong. We see that not only at the central level, but increasingly at a state level as well. So public capex is extremely strong and likely to continue. We saw in the budget that capex was increased by 25%. At the same time, private capex, private capex means household capex on real estate. That is also so showing a sharp improvement. And when you see the results of leading real estate companies and you look at their launches, um, they are hitting sort of um, multi-year highs and uh, uh, real estate is certainly something which is recovering. Uh, corporate capex has so far eluded. Corporate capex has been a little bit uh, muted for the last couple of years. But uh, what we've tried to highlight on the right-hand side on the chart below is how CapEx announcements have uh, certainly improved. So typically this, uh, first you see CapEx announcements and then you actually see CapEx on the ground. So what we're trying to highlight here is within investments, uh, public CapEx is going strong. Private CapEx on real estate is also going strong. Corporate CapEx, which has so far been a bit of a laggard, is also likely to improve over a period of time. Certainly if you take heed of the kind of announcements which have taken place uh, in the last year. So the CapEx story remains robust. Uh, where the story is a little bit more mixed is on the consumption front. Uh, and if you were to break up consumption between the rural segment and the urban segment, uh, the rural segment has so far been weak, uh, but there is an expectation that things will start to pick up. And one of the reasons for that, of course, is we've seen rural wages start to see an uptick and an improvement and have now reached 6 7% uh, in terms of rural wage inflation. And when wages increase, of course, you have more purchasing power. Uh, but the risk here is, of course, uh, how the monsoons play out. So far, the monsoons have been uneven with the north getting more than their fair share and the uh, rest of the country being in deficit. So we'll have to see. But rural consumption, which has been weak so far, we think is getting close to bottoming out. And that has been called out by many consumer staple companies uh, in the last couple of quarters as well. So it's not that it is recovering very fast, but at least a bottom seems to be have created. On the urban side, actually, things have been uh, very strong. So we have seen... Uh, 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 because of high wage inflation on the urban side, uh, the strength in IT and excess savings, we've seen urban consumption has been so far quite strong. But we feel that over a period of time, this will correct. There's already been a slowdown of sorts in IT um, and the excess savings are being consumed. So while rural consumption has been weak, we expect an improvement. And while urban consumption has been strong, we do expect some kind of deceleration. And we see this in our interaction with companies as well. Uh, that is the kind of feedback that we received. So what our broad observation is that uh, the investment part of the economy is still on a very strong footing and could act potentially get stronger if corporate capex picks up. The consumption bit is uh, has been mixed and is likely to remain mixed. Um, the sh there might be a shift in mix between rural and, and urban with urban coming down a little bit and rural picking up a little bit. But uh, let me add so a few more uh, thoughts uh, to the economy, and then we'll get to the markets conversation. I think what, two uh, very important factors which are driving growth in the economy. And they're worth pointing out because these factors are very long-term in nature. The first is we are seeing a huge shift in demand from unorganized companies to organized companies, what is called formalization. And this is interesting because it is pervasive and it is something that we see across sectors. We see it in jewelry, we see it in footwear, we see it in luggage, we see it in plywood, we see it in pharma, we see it across various sectors. And this is important because in India, the unorganized sector is very, very large. 
right? Depending on which industry you look at, the unorganized sector is 20, 30, 40, 50, 60% of uh, various industries. So when a shift in demand takes place from 60%, which is unorganized, to the 30, 40, 50%, which is unorganized, it's a big boost to organized listed companies. And I think this is a big positive trend which we are seeing. And the fact that it is spread across so many sectors gives us confidence that this is something that is likely to continue. And that is the feedback that we get on the ground as well. The second big change which we are seeing is the China plus one story. And so far, the China plus one story for many years has just been that. It's been a story. It's not really been a reality. Uh, this story began at the time of Trump raising tariffs uh, on China uh, five, six years back and then gained momentum as political turbulence set in. And then, of course, much further momentum uh, because of the uh, of the advent of COVID. Uh, we are now seeing that uh, China plus one is is gaining actual traction. It is not just a conversation, but we are seeing a lot of global companies coming to India, investing in physical assets. This is a, a key conversation that you see across boards of global Fortune 500 companies. So the China plus one story is not just a story. It is, it is real. It is taking place. We see that in pharma. We see that in auto ancillaries. We see that in textiles. Um, so I think these are two big, big, broad uh, trends that we wanted to call out and which are very supportive for India's longer term growth. And see, these are some of the other trends. So we've spoken about the first two we've spoken about. And the reason we've highlighted these are because we think these are large trends. These are not trends for the next six months, but these are trends for years to come uh, in some cases. And uh, the shift from the organized towards organized is one. The China plus one story is the other. The third, which is a big positive, is we've seen a sharp improvement in the profitability of banks. NPA ratios, which are 7 8% in 2018, have now fallen 2 to 3% and are holding up at that rate. And so banks are in a much better position to lend. Liquidity is uh, is much better from a banking standpoint. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, you need liquidity to push the economy forward. So NPAs are down, capital adequacy is up, and we've seen an improvement in credit offtake. Credit offtake is now running at a reasonable double digit. So banks are in a far better situation. And when banks do well, and when banks have the ability and the risk appetite to lend, um, it provides the ammunition for growth. Uh, housing is another key segment. We've uh, we alluded to that earlier as well. Um, but housing has seen a meaningful pickup. And one of the reasons has been, of course, housing prices have been flat for many years and uh, salaries have moved up which means that affordability has improved. But I think more importantly even is the, the advent of RERA. And RERA provides an environment of protection for the purchaser. So I think if you go back uh, to prior to RERA, people were quite hesitant to buy under construction because of the risks involved. And it's not that there are no risks today, but the risks have come down significantly and there is a lot more responsibility on the developer. Um, in this environment. So I think these are three or four important points uh, that we wanted to highlight. Um, I'll skip number five, six, seven, but I will point out certainly that there are, as always, going to be risks when investing in equities. I think the chief risk today is the global slowdown. Uh, what is happening outside of India is still a question mark. How, how much and how quickly will the US and Europe slow down is still extremely uncertain. And to the extent that 20% of India's GDP is exports, uh, it is that it is while India is relatively insulated, we are not completely insulated. So I think that's uh, one of the key risks out there. And the second is, of course, inflation and interest rates. And I'll touch upon this in a later slide as well. Uh, but higher inflation and higher interest rates uh, obviously have a dampening effect uh, on demand on one hand. It also results in equity valuations uh, tending to drift downwards when inflation and interest rates are higher. So I think those are two risks. Uh, in my mind, the inflation risk is uh, is tempering. We are seeing certainly globally inflation coming down. Commodity prices are weak. The China reopening has been disappointing, which is good for commodity prices because if China had reopened very strongly, it would have put pressure on commodity prices. But the fact that China has post-COVID not opened that strongly means that the pressure on commodities has come off. So. Um, I think we've covered a little bit uh, on the Indian economy. We'll just quickly run through the U.S. Uh, economy. I think we'll spend a little bit less time here. But I think it's fair to say that uh, growth uh, expectations uh, have come down. 
um, this will have an impact on of course demand to indian companies but i think more importantly as growth slows down uh, inflation and interest rates can also come off the labor market is quite tight in the us uh, but there are signs of easing there as well so i think the without getting into the specific numbers i think the point we're trying to make on the us economy is growth has so far surprised positively right and uh, we are now seeing that growth coming off a little bit which is something that is anticipated and which is something which is desirable because you don't want very strong growth to continue because if they did then inflation and interest rate have the risk of running away so we are seeing growth is coming down a little bit inflation is softening a little bit so the risk of a hard landing as they call it seems to be receding and things seem to be coming a little bit more under control at this point of time uh this is interesting because china plays such a large role in commodities uh the chinese reopening has been a big disappointment um whether it's real estate or exports or industrial demand consumer demand have all been weak weaker than anticipated and what does this mean this means that uh, the pressure on commodities because china is a large manufacturer china is a large domestic economy the pressure on commodity prices has come off quite a bit and if you look at prices in the last 3 months 6 months which you can see in the bottom right hand corner commodity prices have come off very sharply now this is good news um, at two levels for india one is of course for the overall economy we are large consumers of oil and large importers of oil so this helps certainly on that front the second is from a corporate profitability standpoint um while we were facing the headwinds of high commodity prices for many years we are now facing the tailwind of lower commodity prices so this will certainly help the margins of companies uh, going forward so that certainly is a positive so i think that's the key message from this is the china recovery has been slower than we had expected and that's a good news from a commodity price standpoint so that's the a very uh, quick snapshot uh, on uh, our perspective on the economy i'll just summarize it very quickly that the indian economy really stands out uh, from a growth perspective uh, doing much better than others from an inflation perspective inflation being controlled and from a political standpoint we have a number of long term factors at play which include a shift from unorganized to organized china plus one investment by government in infrastructure and so on i think these will continue for many years to come the global economy is slowing down which is which will impact india as well so i don't think india will be insulated but it also means that inflation and interest rates will come under some control now having summarized that let us get to the more exciting part um, the equity markets and clearly equity markets have seen a very sharp rally uh, march till date in fact i think mid caps and small cap indices are up almost 20% so it's a very sharp rally that we have seen uh, large caps are up around 10% So the question that a lot of investors ask uh, is, what do we do now? So let us first, uh, uh, besides the fact that the Indian economy is doing well, let us look at the other reason, which has been liquidity, and we've seen um, foreign investors uh, put in a fair amount of money this year, and I think that has certainly pushed up markets. Um, so the key question is, how do valuations stack up today, and how should we adjust our expectations of returns going forward? uh let us start with nifty uh nifty valuations of course nifty is also recovered not as much as mid cap and small cap and nifty is also recovered and valuations today what we have here is the one year forward p chart and what today is at about 18 and a half times compared to an average of about 17 so nifty is trading at about a 10% premium right it's not terribly expensive so normally you get nervous when markets are 30 40% expensive when you get very excited when markets are 30 40% cheap right um 10 15% premium plus minus is still numbers which are i think uh, manageable and nifty valuations at a 10% premium is not uh, is not uh, extremely expensive it's just uh, moderately expensive in our minds uh, um and uh, and keep in mind that large caps is almost uh 70 75% of the market so almost 70 75% of the market when looked uh, in aggregate valuations seem to be decent right and this is what the left hand chart shows that p valuations at 18 and a half times are uh, reasonably close to long term averages uh when you look at the same valuation metric but now you compare it to emerging markets so this is india's valuation compared to emerging market valuations on average india has been about 45% at a, at a premium of 45% and compared to that 45% premium we are about a 55% premium so it's about a 10% jump from the past 
So again, when you look at that metric, uh, it doesn't seem that uh, large caps at least are uh, terribly expensive today. Um, and the reason India trades at a premium is uh, because we have higher growth and higher return on equity. And that's something which we've seen for many, many years. So the point uh, that we're trying to make in large caps is that yes, while the Nifty has moved up, uh, the valuations are at only a 10% premium. We still think large caps offer reasonable value today. And 10% is not something when you for, for an investor who's, for example, if you're looking at it from a 10 year perspective, it will take away less than sort of uh, a percent of your returns uh, between half a percent to 1% if you invest uh, at a 10% premium. The story is a little bit different when we look at mid caps and small caps, um, because mid caps and small caps have rallied uh, a little bit more, uh, considerably more than large caps. And now mid caps. Um, have a forward PE, one year forward PE of about 23 times versus an average of about 18. And the story, we have the next slide is on small caps, but uh, the valuations are similar in the sense that they do trade, small caps also trade at roughly about a 20% uh, premium. This is premium compared to how they've traded historically. So compared to the last 10 years average, mid caps and small caps are at about a 20% uh, premium. So what does that mean? So that means I think if you look at two types of investors, I think investing for the short term is not something that uh, I would ever encourage. I think you've got to be either a medium investor or a long-term investor. So a medium-term investor is an invest for, let's say, four to five years. Long-term investor is 10 years plus. Now, interestingly, uh, so markets are at 20% more expensive than average. If you're a 10-year investor, it doesn't matter much. Because if you're a 10-year investor, 20% premium, 20 divided by 10, take the power of compounding into... Uh, into account, and you are compromising maybe a percent, percent and a half, percent and a half of returns. Uh, so normally, uh, equity returns tend to be 13, 15 uh, for the overall market. Mid caps, small caps often do better. Uh, so giving up a percent, percent and a half is uh, is not uh, yeah, is a is not a big sacrifice. Um, so I think when you look at long term investing in mid caps and small caps, I think that remains um, a positive outlook. I think the concern is really when you look at it a little bit from a shorter term standpoint. Um, so 20% uh, excess valuation means we need to tone down our expectations of returns from a medium term standpoint. So for investors looking at sort of a five year perspective, I think one should bring down return expectations by two, 3% uh, to adjust for this excess valuation. Uh, I think investors will still do reasonably well, but I think you need to uh, tone down expectations because uh, mid caps and small caps, their valuations have expanded. I'm a big believer, a big believer in, in small cap, mid cap for a, from a long term standpoint, uh, because I think there are a lot of opportunities, there are a lot of misunderstandings in valuations, there's a lot of volatility, uh, there's a lot of uh, um, this information is not easily available, and so on and so forth. So I think mid caps and small caps from a 10 year perspective still offer a fantastic opportunity. But yes, the market has rallied quite sharply and the market is up 20% in a, in a short period of time. And of course, uh, if you, uh, the last couple of years, mid cap, small caps have done extremely well. And our valuations are uh, at a 20% premium. So I think we need to tone down our expectations to that extent. Similarly, in uh, small caps, I think the story in small caps is also similar. Uh, uh, the uh, valuation is at about 17 times versus an average of about 14 and a half. So again, it's at about 18% premium. So both mid, both mid and small are roughly at the same kind of 18 to 20% premium compared to how they've traded historically. I'll briefly talk uh, a little bit about sectors and then we can uh, move to Q&A uh, post concluding the presentation. But just, just a, some perspective in terms of how valuations for sectors have moved. Um, we've seen uh, IT valuations have obviously corrected and that's the top left-hand chart. Valuations have corrected quite meaningfully from the top. Um, banks continue to be reasonably priced in this environment. And uh, while investments is a, is a theme that we believe in materially, uh, capital good companies do trade at a significant premium. So we need to be careful how we pick and choose companies and add them to our portfolios. Um, but uh, what we've shown on the left-hand table is oil and gas, IT, pharma, electric utilities, and uh, public and private sector banks are broadly close to their uh, historical valuations. And uh, consumer, tobacco, auto, uh, durable companies are more expensive than the historical valuations. 
how typically we get more excited when valuations are in our favor and we typically get more nervous when valuations are against us. But having said that, a lot of this is still very stock specific. So even if consumer durables as a sector, as an example, is expensive, we may still be able to find reasonable companies within that and vice versa, even if a company, even if a sector is cheap, there'll be many companies that we don't like. So we don't advocate, this is not an advocacy of any particular sector, but just to give you some sense in terms of how sector valuations are today. Uh, this is interesting because what we've highlighted here is how sector performances change. And I think this is a, probably a more important point. Uh, we have shown uh, sector, the top two sectors we've highlighted uh, going back uh, 10, 12 years, what you can see is the top two performers, they change a lot, right? So there'll be a period of time when IT does well, and then pharma does well, and then cap goods do, does well, but nothing does well on a continuous basis because everything needs to take uh, a check or a breather at some point of time. So we've seen that in whether it's in auto or in banks or in FMCG, et cetera. So market constantly goes through rotation. So I think this is an important point to make because this rotation is across uh, various parameters. Now, what does rotation mean? It means that different parts of the market do well at different points. This is true for market cap, right? So sometimes large caps do better, sometimes small caps do better, sometimes mid caps do better. And the market tends to ro rotate between large cap, mid cap, large cap, mid cap. So I think that's and that's one clear rotation which takes place. Uh, markets also rotate between sectors. So sometimes you'll see uh, banks do well, other times you'll see pharma doing well and so on and so forth. So markets tend to rotate between uh, sectors as well. The market also rotates between styles. So there is a growth style, there's a value style. So sometimes market will be more driven by growth and other times by value, and that also rotates. Sometimes these rotation periods are shorter, sometimes they're longer. So it's difficult to, tend to tell when the turning point happens. But I think the key is, the key point from this is to be diversified. Because what investors want, unfortunately, is to only own what is doing well and not to own what is doing badly. But it is very difficult to figure out what is doing well and how long it will do well and when that will switch over. So that is why we say that you know investors not to time uh, the market and to remain invested and not to time sub-segments of the market. So I think to always have a presence in large cap, mid cap, small cap. And even today when um, small caps and mid caps are expensive, does that mean that you abandon small cap, mid cap and sell it all? Absolutely not. You can trim it a little bit or not add to it or add to large caps a little bit more. So that may be a more appropriate strategy. Uh, but I think to have an exposure in all three categories is extremely important. The same is true across sectors uh, as well, and the same is true for styles. So I think we've tried to highlight here how it is quite visible across sectors. Uh, so a good example of this would be would be IT, uh, where IT today is a sector which seems quite challenged. But if you go back two years ago, IT was a sector which was greatly loved. And if you go back Five years before that, IT was or six years, seven years before that, IT was seen as a sector which was of uh, sedate growth. So IT has gone through being considered to be sedate growth, to being high growth, back to being sedate growth. Same is true for pharma. Pharma has been a loved sector um, during COVID uh, and uh, even after that. But prior to that was a was a sector which had a lot of issues uh, and so on. So I think the key in this, uh, you know, we've in this presentation we've covered the economy, global economy, India, we cover the stock market. But what we've not covered is the most important, uh, which is how to think of investing. And in this, the key is the following two or three things. The first is to remain invested as long as possible. Uh, there is no, uh, uh, no better way to invest than to invest for a, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. The longer, the better. And the advantage of long-term investing is that if you get into the market at the wrong time, if you get into the market when it is very expensive, because you've invested for such a long period and because growth takes place in that period, that it takes care of the mistake of entering at expensive valuation. So long-term investing is extremely important. Systematic investing is also extremely important. So regular investing so that you capture highs and lows and you keep putting money into at, at works. I think that's the second bit. Asset allocation, how much you have in equities, how much you have in debt, I think we focus too much on choosing fund houses and not enough on our sector, our, sorry, our asset allocation. So this is less about HDFC versus other fund houses. This is making sure that you have the right amount of money into equities. So I think long-term investing, SIP investing, asset allocation, and being contrarian. I think if these, these would be the four pillars that I would think of investing. 
being contrarian means that be aggressive. Um, certainly when market goes through uh, turmoil, uh, it's difficult to invest in those environments, but that is a very rewarding environment uh, to be invested in. So I think uh, while we've spoken about a lot of specifics, I think these four pillars of investing are really the key um, for long-term success. So I think that's it. Uh, I will just summarize it by saying this, that India's growth uh, is really, uh, today is, stands out from both an absolute and relative standpoint. Uh, India's inflation is also steadied and uh, compares very favorably. So India really is in a sweet spot. And I think that's why markets have uh, rallied as they have. And while markets have rallied, uh, keep in mind that large caps, which is 75% of the uh, overall market, continue to be reasonably priced. And small caps and mid caps, where I think some caution is merited. But again, if you are a long-term investor, um, I, I think there is still a very positive outlook on those two sub-segments as well. Uh, it's really the near term where I think one should bring down one's return expectations. Uh, but in the key in all of this, as I mentioned, is to look at the four or five pillars of investing, which is invest for the long term, invest in a regular fashion, look at asset allocation and to be contrarian. I think those are the most important, more important than all these slides put together are the, the four pillars that we just mentioned. Uh, so with that, uh, we, we would like to thank everybody who's been on the call. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.